Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 57. As always, I'm Mark. Here with me today is Matt. That's a nice prime number. That's good. Fewer and fewer of those as we go on. 57 is not prime, Matt. Ah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 59's prime. Yeah, it is. So we'll have to wait for 59 then. That's, that's How many primes point. have we had so far? I, I don't know. One. Count them. One not prime. Are we going to count the primes up until 59 four, right now? 13, 17, 19, 23, 40, 1, 43, 16 <laughs> primes? 16 primes so far. Also, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Today. I feel like we should start over now. <laughs> well, you don't think counting the primes silently? Up to fifty-seven, mumbling is uh, is riveting podcasts. No, agree to disagree, Matt. Uh, today, <laughs> prime numbers are important. <laughs> today, we're going to be talking about party games and how to critique them or how to criticize them, which is something. Spoiler: I've... Counting primes aloud is our number one party game. <laughs> <laughs> we are the most interesting people you will ever meet. Yes. Uh, this, I thought about this topic when I was reviewing, when I was writing my review of Reigns, colon, The Council, which is the full name of that game, uh, which is right back here if you're on the, uh, if you're watching the Patreon video, it's uh, Obscured in Darkness. Matt is now holding it up. Uh, I posted that last week or the week before, perhaps. And it was an annoying review to write. Not because it was a 6 out of 10 review, which is typically annoying reviews to write. The ones that fall in that kind of mediocre to decent range. Uh, But because it was a party game that requires the participants to kind of buy into the premise of the game to make the game fun. And so I typically go about my reviews in terms of what's in the actual game, not what people might bring to the game. But I couldn't do that. And so it got me thinking, do I need to analyze party games differently than I do other board games? And here we are on the couch counting primes. Also, I should check the baseball score. The Cardinals are playing. Yeah, but it's the first... First game of the Penguin season, so we... The, what, hockey's back already? Hockey's back. It rains once and hockey's back? Yeah. All right, it so it's still out. tied 1-1. I'm going to be incessantly checking this. If it's chilly in Boston, the ice is frozen in Canada. Fair. I mean, isn't Boston, though, just as north as a lot of Canada? No. Isn't it? There's a lot of Canada. <laughs> in terms of population. <laughs> like... Isn't it like 95% of the Canadian population is within 50 miles of the of the border? Something like that. Yeah, yeah right? Could, could All the true. populations around their southern border. Could be true. We're just as far north as them. Our, our, our ponds aren't frozen. All right. Anyways, party games. So I was thinking about party games and how to criticize them. And I guess going back now, because I, I, I've clarified in my own mind some thoughts about this, but... I wanted to try to define what a party game was, which turned out to be way more tricky than I first thought, because it's, I don't know, a party game is just kind of like I know it when you see it kind of thing. Yeah, and it's not, it's, it's, it's really not a clean category, because I think it includes very disparate games, Yeah, and then there are games that are very similar to clear party games that we probably wouldn't call party games. Yeah, so first, my first thought was, well, it's just a game you bring to a party. But we've had Twilight Imperium parties, so <laughs> that definition doesn't really work. So I started thinking about what a party game could be, and instead of trying to come up with a strict definition for it, I just wrote down some characteristics that I see a lot in party games that aren't necessary, but appear a lot more, more than in other games. So the first one is that they're relatively short. I'd say typically under an hour, although there are certainly exceptions to that, like Trivial Pursuit can take forever, theoretically, uh, but that's more just bad game design. Uh, the second thing is very simple rules overhead, which is probably true of every party game I can think of, because you just got to teach it to people who are 
happen to be at a party and maybe not be there for playing games or are inebriated. The third thing is drop-in, drop-out capability, which you don't see a whole lot, but you do see more with party games, and it's certainly a nice feature to have in party games. Number four, uh, typically designed to cause laughter or light tension or movement. So a lot more dexterity games you'll have in there, charades-type games. Mm -hmm. Other dexterity games, you know, stacking games like Jenga or... Even more complex ones like the Climbers, I suppose you could define as a party game. Um, there are some that are just designed to cause laughter. And I think a lot of what makes a party game interesting in many cases, I think, is a bit of tension. The suspense of something. And when we talk about some examples, I'll try to point out that. But that seems to be a fairly common recurring feature in party games. Or at least party games that I like. Uh, fifth thing, probably don't need, doesn't need a large table, probably doesn't have a bunch of components. A lot of them can be played without tables. And the sixth thing I thought it was is easier to transport. So typically a small box game, uh, so you can take it with you to parties. And so all these are kind of centered around the idea of something that works at a party. So simple, works at a party, because not everyone's going to be invested. Short, works because you want to do other things that are non-board game focused party. I should clarify, because, like, all my parties are centered around board games. <laughs> so, I'm talking to parties that yeah. like that. Yeah. I think I think I attend a lot of parties that we play just regular board games. Yeah, but you have a social life. So, yeah. You'll be more familiar with these parties that I speak of, in theory, uh, that aren't board games centered. <laughs> yeah, maybe just in theory. Yeah, so those are the six things I thought so, of, kind so of off the top of my head. Immediately re responding to that, even in that list of six things, which I think I generally would agree with, there are tons of exceptions. Yeah. Um, I can't think off the top of my head the exception to the simple rules one. I mean, maybe... I, no, I agree with you. I think I think I agree with you there. Um, actually, so, just to throw an example in there. Yeah. I think we've all included the resistance in our list of party games. Absolutely. Yeah. But I would not include Battlestar Galactica. And I think the primary difference is the rules. Is over. simplicity. Yeah. It's the resistance um, elegance that allows it to be a party game. The resistance breaks two or three of your other points here. But yeah, so I guess really? um it's well, drop in, drop out. You can't. Drop you can't in, drop, drop in, out. drop out. That's the only one. It's not designed for less laughter, tension, light tension, or movement. I, it's I would definitely say, designed I would say for light tension. tension. Yeah, it's definitely designed for tension. It's designed for heavy tension. All right, maybe. Well, it depends on how you're playing. Yeah, we I play think, it incredibly I think, seriously. Yeah, with most people, it would be light tension. Yeah, it would. Okay. Most people, the game okay. resistance okay. takes like fifteen. I, I see what you're we are. At. We are absolutely the outlier. Okay, I, I see what you're getting at. No, in in any case, I think ex so. I think, I think in general, this is a good list, but I think all or most party games probably break the rules piece. here, w which gets at the kind of fuzziness of the category. Yeah, I think I'd say most of them will hit all, but I think the drop in drop out one is the most rare. I think most of the party games that. Or on our list, which is I literally just went to Board Game Geek, uh, sorted by party games that I have rated, and just listed them all. Really, the, look, looking at the list you have here, the only one that I disagree with is Sheriff of Nottingham. I feel like, that yeah, that's it. I, I was surprised that was included, but we'll get to that. I think most of them will will hit five of those at least. Do you want Do you want my working definition of party games? Yeah, go for it. All right, so here's the. Quick working definition I came up with thinking about this at lunch today. Um, party games, I would say, are games designed for larger groups that prioritize a fun, inclusive experience that isn't primarily competitive. And I clarified larger group as best at at least four plus. So yeah, would that's... it be fair to say that two is company, three is a crowd, and four is a party? Uh, yes. Yes, I would say that. Is that the joke you 
Yeah, it's 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 not it's not great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ben planned that joke. <laughs> I'm I'm speechless. Uh, yeah, I think I think the higher player count thing is something I should have added to my list because that's certainly you know if it's just a two player game. Although there's that game I played last year at PAX. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It's by the people who made Secret Hitler. It is a two-player party game. I disagree. I feel like... I think it would work. Because I think... Because each round of the game is only five minutes long, and it is a fantastic spectator game. Okay. I, I can okay. see that working All right. spectator So, game. So in that case, you're at least involving more than two people, and... Not, not in the rules, it's just a um, fun game to watch. Is yeah, it, but in is, the sense of prioritizing a fun, inclusive experience. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, like, if it weren't... Okay, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point. But if it weren't spec, a spectator game, then it wouldn't be a party game. Yeah, I think I, so. I don't think you can call a game that, that's played with two people in a room by themselves a party game. No yeah. matter what they're doing. I think I would consider a party game, yeah, only because I think it would be fun to... Watch and just kind of rotate throughout people. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I can't. Re- the the name's right on the tip of my tongue. Is, is it the? It's not the robots one, right? Yeah, it's the robots. Oh, it's, the um, Blade Runner one. Ah. Now I can't remember the name. Yeah. Uh, it's based it's off really of good. the Blade Runner test. Yeah, yeah. The t- the boy comp test. Is it? But it's not called that. Something human. Inhuman conditions. Ah. That's the yeah. name of it. I don't think it's out yet, but it's. I think it's pretty brilliant. Based on the one play, well, I would need more plays of it. Anyways, that's a weird exception. I do have a squabble with isn't primarily competitive because I think a lot of party games get their fun out of competition. Like, yeah, out of out of the almost like the satire of competition, <clears throat> right? Like, if you're playing a game of, like, Taboo or a word association, password type game like that, there's a lot of excitement generated, and the, the game's only really fun when people get really into the competitive aspect of it, of trying to race against the clock. If you were super laid back and casual yeah. in that kind of game, it wouldn't work. Yeah, But I, there are games not, that are super casual. So, I think that this is what sets party games apart from just other games, is um, it's not that they're not competitive; it's that it prioritizes is the experience, which will be rewarding for everyone in the room, regardless of kind of the competitive nature. And I think a lot of word games really show this. Like even Taboo, to a lesser extent, rewards the individual when it's their turn to give clues, rewards them for their creativity and and for you know catching the attention of other people in the room. Mm-hmm. Even more so with word games like Codenames or Decrypto, where I think you can legitimately lose, or even not really playing to win, but you're just enjoying the the experience of trying to be clever and trying to connect with the people in the room. Yeah. I, I um, think the it's, com- it's not that they're not competitive. Yeah. I think it's the it's it's the prioritization of yeah. an experience. I will say, though, the type of competition you get is when there's just competition in the moment. If someone, like, prepared or thought about their code name's strategy ahead of time, it would probably seem like overkill. Although not necessarily. Like, we've certainly overthought the resistance, and to some extent, code names a bit. But, you know, if someone arrived at the party and they have, like, thoughts planned out for their game of Spyfall or whatever, and they've tried to optimize it, that would kind of destroy it. But the, the heat of the moment kind of thing is, is yeah. where the party game is trying. Yeah. And, and, I mean, and part of what makes a party game a party game is that it incentivizes you to connect with people in the room. And so, yeah, that's good. And so um, there's only so much pre-thought you can do. Like, if you're the, the one guy who is, like, way too serious about board games, and you have... You have like mathed out a code name strategy. It does you no good if no one's on, on on the same page. Yeah. To that, we might also add that party games are typically in very interactive. Uh, interactive. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think that is pretty central. Agreed. No, that's that's good. Uh, 
those are those are good thoughts. We might add a couple to the list then informally. Let's talk about inclusivity because that's very important to a party game in terms of it being a success at a party. And that's generally a good thing, although some games just don't want to be inclusive, especially in terms of the rules difficulty. So for me, as a critic of board games, that's maybe something I'll take note of in my review, but yeah. it's not something that I'm necessarily going to give a lot of weight to unless it's like, unless it destroys the experience. Like it's just needlessly complicated and it could be, you know, it'd be much improved with some editing, but you got to get to the game on its own terms in a complicated game is trying to be complex. Yeah. Does that mean then that I need to evaluate party games in terms of how broadly appealing I think they will be? That's like the fundamental thing that tripped me up in Reigns. Because I don't think Reigns is super broadly appealing. I think it worked pretty well with our group, and especially with me and Amber because we played the digital game. But there's a lot of buy-in that needs to happen in order to make that game work. If you take it too seriously, it's just going to fail. If you don't buy into the just the, the storytelling premise, it's going to yeah. fail. So, so is that a criticism of the game, or do I look beyond that and assume that the buy-in is there? I, I think a little bit of both. I mean, you can we can talk about how well does the game encourage that buy-in. Now, there are people and groups of people who will always buy into whatever setting they're a part of, mm -hmm. or who will never buy into kind of a setting in order to l look past some maybe rules, uh, loopholes. So you have extremes where the buy-in thing just won't work. But how well does that game encourage people who are maybe on the fence of buying in to actually buy in? Yeah, I think, I think you're right there. I think that's relevant to a critique of the game. But I, I get very concerned, because here, here's my thing. I get concerned that I don't want to fall into the trap that so many reviewers fall into of just trying to predict what if their audience is going to like the game, or like the movie, or like whatever they're reviewing. So I strongly believe that's not the role of the critic. It isn't to say, this thing has a lot of appealing attributes, or the thing I hate in board game reviews, is when they give a list, this game has this, this, and this mechanism, so if you like those mechanisms, you'll like the game. Like, that yeah. gives no more information than literally just looking up the list of mechanisms <laughs> on Board Game Geek. Like, you're not adding anything. You might as well just list them the facts about the game. Like, maybe that's what these people who argue about objective reviews actually want, but in that point, there's no point to the, to the critic. If I take that as an assumption... And if I take it as an assumption that there is value in this thing we call critiquing, then what I talk about in my perspective needs to be something other than, are there attributes of this thing that are widely appealing? But at the same time, and again, this is the kind of loop, loopy rabbit hole my brain fell into the other night as I came up with this topic, especially in board games, like you could argue other art forms, like the role of the critic a role of a critic is to make the more avant-garde communicate that to the masses more, right? And, 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 and discuss the importance and appeal of something that may not be broadly liked or may actually be broadly disliked because it's weird or super innovative and, and violates norms or whatever. I think there's some of that in board games, but there are very few board games that are actually super weird. So, given that, a lot of the things that make board games successful are also attributes that I think make good board games. So, people yeah. generally like what I would say are good board games. That's not true of, for instance, movies. And I think there's, a, there's more of a dispute in movies where the masses at large are, have different preferences than critics. Um, right. So does that make board game criticism kind of irrelevant? That's the dilemma I'm in. I think how or I want to hear your thoughts because I do have a resolution to this, but I, I'm curious what yeah. you guys think of that thought process. I, I think like maybe one of the differences between 
board game criticisms and like movies is that the audience is much larger for movies and you get a, a lot larger of a cross section of like culture so that you can it, it's it's easier to generalize which is weird because it does seem like there's more of a distinction between like the what is it the rotten tomatoes score where people will like the critics are usually different than the than the the audiences and i think because the critics are viewing them very differently than the audiences, but because board game reviewers tend to also be like the target demographic of board games, I think that might be why reviews tend to be more closely aligned. No, I mean, in both situations, the I mean, the people making the games are trying to make money; they're trying to be mm-hmm. appealing. In you know, not exclusively, there are people who make movies and who make board games that are trying to do something you know, philosophical or personal, for personal reasons, other than just trying to maximize profit. I think the difference is that board games often have far, for lack of a better word, lower artistic ambitions, where the ambition is just to, like, present something interesting or fun, whereas a movie may have more lofty artistic ambitions, or more esoteric, I suppose. Well, I'd like to see board games try to do that a bit more, and some of them are. Uh, I think that's probably the root of it. I, I do think party games are really an interesting subsection of board games in general because they're kind of the the board games for people who aren't really board gamers. So it's they're kind of I think they're generally not specifically aimed at the same group that games in general are because they're trying to bring new people into the hobby who may never come in there, you know, of their if, if it were left to them to play the the board games that we like and that we find popular. Um, yeah. yeah, and in that sense, almost, there's a bit, there's more of a discrepancy between kind of what critics would enjoy most and what sells the best. A lot of that's due to availability and, like, what's on the mass market shelves. And what's and just what known. people are know. Like, yeah, pe- people what, know what, about apples to apples. People know about Cards Against Humanity. People might not necessarily know yeah. about, like, Twilight Imperium or... Right, other... but I mean, even, like, the Resistance is not as... I assume is not as popular as Taboo or Apples to Apples. Yeah, that's... Just yeah. because it's a smaller publisher, it's not a it's not a major publisher. But I mean, in that vein, like, Codename seems like a real discrepancy. Like, that's definitely a party game for board gamers... And it's done very well mass market. Yeah. That feels kind of weird, actually. You wouldn't expect that. The interesting thing about Codenames is that it's a party game that actually involves, like, a good amount of, like, measured thought. Because, like, the other games, like Taboo and Apples to Apples, they require thought, but it's, like, very fast thought or, like, kind of trying to second guess, like, okay, well, if I do this, is this person going to like it? There's not a lot of, you know, n- not a lot of concrete knowledge. You're just kind of going off the off the cuff. Where Codenames, you're actually sitting down and, like, looking at it from different sides and trying to come up with something that will connect these words. And it's... I, I don't really think there's another game like it that I can think of that involves, like, you know, there's definite good and bad answers for Codenames. Other than games that were clearly inspired by code names, sure, yeah. sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe password. I guess password kind of inspired code names. Yeah. So um, going back to my dilemma, though, do you have any thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah. So, actually, can you just restate your dilemma? Yeah, there it's for me. the idea that as a critic, I don't want to just try to guess at what people are going to like because that's not actually adding yeah. in any information. But one of the things that party games presumably need okay. to do okay. Okay. is be widely appealing. Yeah, so I think one thing that's different from board games than a, a lot of other you know, common arenas of critique um, is that they fundamentally require so much buy-in from the individual. They're fundamentally interactive. They require um, participation. And so to a certain extent... Um, those experiential things 
are going to be determined more by the individuals involved. And I think that's why it gets very blurry, you know, one party game versus another. And all these things, I think, are even even more accentuated in party games. You know, people who are playing a party game, it might be a bad party game, but if they buy in, their personalities are going to be coming out and their interactions are going to be fun, Mm -hmm. often in spite of the game. They might not even realize that they're having fun in spite of the game. It just... The game becomes a thing that they come together around and have a great time. That's fine. So maybe the role of the critic here is to make people aware of actually what what the games are doing and maybe show like so this game that you don't know about could could draw you into the same kind of experience except it does it better. Do you see the No, the, no I the I, I see your thought? point. <laughs> yeah. I want to save my final conclusion on this particular issue for the end. Sure. Were there any other aspects of party games you guys wanted to talk about? Anything that stood out to you from the list, actually, which I found super interesting. So, again, I looked through Board Game Geek and filtered by the party games that I have rated, as categorized by Board Game Geek. A lot of the games we've been talking about. Captain Sonar is a weird one, because that's fairly complex, but it's, it's a party game. Um... Codenames to Crypto, Resistance, Deception, Secret Hitler, Sheriff of Nottingham is, again, that kind of in between one. Skull, The Mine, Spyfall, Wits and Wagers, Coup, Pictomania, all the way down to Trivial, Trivial Pursuit. Fun fact, uh, the lowest rated party game on Board Game Geek is Bingo, <laughs> uh, probably because it's not a game. Uh, Blackjack was on the list, actually, which I found interesting. What? <laughs> I guess that fits. Yeah, yeah. It scales. Yeah, it scales for sure. It has. Yeah. It's not entirely luck. It does have yeah. some decision points. It's a push your luck game. Anything interesting from that list of games? I I think Bang is kind of masquerading as a party game. But have you ever tried to explain Bang to a room full of people who've never explained Bang before? <laughs> it is a nightmare. There are so many symbols on the cards that are not explained, and the reference points are <laughs> horrible. I, I think it's just a poorly designed it, game. I, that, it, it is that too, <laughs> but like I don't, I don't think Bang. I would not consider Bang a party game. Yeah, I think that's an in betweeny one. Although it, it's theoretically trying to be like a deduction game, but uh, I didn't see a whole lot of the a whole lot of other like hard deduction games. There's social deduction for sure, but again, only the lighter ones. Yeah. Uh, although Secret Hitler is fairly complex, also that's a game I would not want to teach. Actually, Secret Hitler. It's got a lot of weird stuff going on in it. One thing that I really was thinking about that the list the list really uh, drives home is there are very, there are just very different subgroups of party games. Yeah, and like yeah, and, and critiquing deduction games and social deduction games versus critiquing maybe the creative games, mm-hmm. um, your word games plus Pictionary and Friends. Those are just completely different. I don't know what the point is there, but it just the category of party game is just a weird animal. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, there's... It's a, it's a super type. Yeah, there's, at least on my list, there's a lot of social deduction. There's your word association games, a lot of that. And then you've got dexterity games like Jenga. Okay, yeah. And trivia games. Yeah. Although... It put Trivial Pursuit as a party game, oh, and Wits and Wagers, but not Terra, unless it was just way further down the list, which, I don't know, BGG oddities. And then you yeah, got... Yeah, so... so well, and I'd like to highlight, actually, one game on the list, because it's, like, uncategorizable. I guess it, it's it's dexterity. Uh, Bunny Bunny Moose Moose, <laughs> yeah, which I, I was delighted to see on the list, yep. because yeah. what a... What a game. What a game. What an odd, stupid game. (laughs) Yeah, another thing that came to mind is, like, I think you can rate games on two axes. How good of a game is this, and how good of a party game is this? Um, And and those aren't necessarily correlated. Uh, Terra is is maybe an interesting case in that it is a good trivia game, but it lacks some of the spark of some of the other trivia games, in my experience. 
Like, even yeah. Trivial Pursuit, which is a bad game, has more of a party feel. I think it comes down to the suspense. And a lot of the yeah. things, because I'm looking at the games that feel borderline to me, all of them have suspense. And I'm looking specifically at Captain Sonar. Very suspenseful game. in or uh, More frantic, right? It's real yeah. time. Um, and Sheriff of Nottingham, which is entirely built around suspense. Um, and I think you have those those moments of suspense and excitement because you almost necessarily need suspense for excitement to happen, right? It's, it's a build-up and release. Uh, that's one of the ways we laugh. That's like how mm-hmm. humor is formed. Um, humor oftentimes is essentially... Like a joke can essentially just be... A matter of suspense. I, I, I read about like the fundamental types of humor, and that was a big one of them. There, I think people have found three or something like that. There's like just like straight up absurdity, suspense. I don't remember the other, but maybe slapstick. Uh, but yeah, that seems to be a huge part of it. Of not knowing, for instance, if uh, the lie is correct in any of these social deduction games. You know, the flipping of the... And a lot of the games specifically have a physical element that enhances the, sus, the suspense. So, like, yeah. the little flipping of the, the, the coasters and skull, the the click of the bag and Sheriff of Nottingham. You've got the stupid buzzer and Taboo. <laughs> You've got Bunny Bunny Moose Moose again. The person reading the Germanic poem uh, is like a little countdown clock, uh, which adds that element that seems to be and obviously on something like Jenga that seems to be such a common theme that I hadn't thought of before yeah. two party games and I think that's why probably some of these are included that seem a bit sketchy so does the critic of a party game primarily need to or or largely need to tell how the game creates an atmosphere for people to interact in fun ways yeah I think that's part of it so Here's what I came up with when I was thinking about the dilemma. And I return back to that I don't really need to adjust my perspective on criticism at all. In that party games can function just fine in terms of my criticism if I just keep the principles that I strive to keep anyways. So initially I thought they were kind of, and this is a horrible phrase that is borrowed from bad cultural stuff regarding movie criticism, but... They feel like they're critic proof uh, because if someone picks up, a, if a group of people grab a party game that I just despise <laughs> and they go and they're laughing and having fun, like, what am I, I'm not going to, as a critic, it's not your job to go and say, no, you shouldn't be having fun. <laughs> like, unless there's a moral element to it, then no. If you're enjoying Cards Against Humanity, you're a bad person. <laughs> I enjoyed Cards Against Humanity the first time I played it. Uh, but yeah, some questionable moral elements there. Uh, but like, I can't go up and say, no, you shouldn't be having fun with that. It's a, right. you know, there's a superior game you could be playing. No, they're having fun. Like, yeah, yeah. That's just being a bad person. But that's true of any game. Yeah. Like, I don't care if anyone likes a game that I hate or despise or think is okay. As a critic, it's not your job to tell people what to like. It's your job to, at hopefully, a more complex level, a more... The thing about naming your outlet the Thoughtful Gamer is that you feel very (laughs) self-conscious about using the word thoughtful when you say anything. Uh, On a more thoughtful level, explain an experience that you had, explain how the game brings out has brought out those elements, explain things that are auxiliary to the game that the game brings to mind. So to start a conversation at where the game is at the basis of that conversation and hopefully create a better dialogue generally about yeah. games, about life, yeah. about reality in the process. Yeah. A critic isn't supposed to be the final word on the quality of something. Criticism is supposed to be a form of discussion about that yeah. thing. Yeah, you, you're you're dialoguing with the thing itself. Yeah, and, and with and, whoever might be reading. Yeah, and 
some uh, often that just means you're kind of teasing out why a thing works or doesn't. And in that discussion, if people are interested at all in hearing what you have to say, mm-hmm. they can agree or disagree with what you 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 say. But hopefully, they've then also interacted with kind of the the underlying reasons why something is fun. Yeah, and maybe and hopefully fun. they've learned something or they thought yeah. about it in a way they hadn't before. Good criticism should be kind of this empathetic thing where you're not like condemning someone for liking something or having a certain experience. Yeah. You're kind of digging into your own experience trying to communicate that information and hopefully share some part of you and your thoughts and uh, yeah, you and your thoughts with that person. And then maybe they can continue on that discussion. The thing that the concluding statement, which I think kind of encapsulates my final thoughts on this that I wrote out is that criticism shouldn't erase experience. It should enhance experience. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so much of the dialogue around criticism is assuming that the critic is trying to erase experience, that they're trying to be the final word on something or tell someone what they ought to think. And in some cases, as a critic, you are making an argument, right? You are trying to, you you are putting forward support for a particular perspective. Sometimes that's deeply personal, in which case, sure, it's subjective. Sometimes you're making a more objective argument. So in some senses, maybe you're trying to get someone to think about something in a different way, but not in a party pooper right. way. That, like that, you're that just, doesn't erase the an experience argument. that they've already had. Yeah. Or even prevent them from having that experience again. Right. Um, yeah. But it might allow them to have a different experience or... Mm-hmm. or say, hey, actually, we should try this other game because maybe it'll give us a similar experience but could be even better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. You're not erasing anything. You're enhancing. And yeah, I mean, one of, the, I, one of my favorite things is if I watch a movie that I really find interesting, maybe I don't love it, but I find it... Maybe I don't understand part of it, but I find it engaging or I think there's more there, I'll go try to read a bunch of criticism about the movie... Uh, from people who I know write intelligently about movies, and then either that will help me understand what I just saw, or sometimes I go back and watch it again with that new information in mind yeah. and try to kind of broaden my uh, my perspective. Um, I think that's kind of an ideal situation. And yeah. so, I don't know, this whole, this whole yeah. thought process is kind of maybe yeah. re... There's a... Reaffirm kind of the thoughts I had floating around but yeah. weren't super concrete about what my goal is in, in writing board game criticism. Um, I have an example, or just like a, a board game story that probably most people have had in some form. But I remember, right when I was getting into the hobby, I remember some co-workers talking about Shadows Over Camelot, mm-hmm. which I think was, was one of the first big gamers social deduction games. Yeah, it was one of the first games I bought. It was um, like in my second per- round of purchases. Yeah, and um, I remember some coworkers talking about it and just had, like, they were having amazing game night experiences and they loved this game and were playing it a whole bunch. That game is a far worse game than The Resistance. And the experience of the kind of social deduction that they were having were definitely, like, Resistance creates those feelings far more efficiently as far as a, like, a, um, if you think of a board game as an experience engine, you know. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, efficient. Yeah, that's a good word. Uh, I think there's a lot of just nonsense fluff in Chavez over Camelot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is but, the, but, but this is the, the part where I have to restrain myself against violating the principles yeah. I just expound. But here's I the, really hate that game. Here's the thing. There were, like, three or four couples... Um, that that just had a great time together playing Shadows over Camelot for a couple of years. Those experiences were real, and there's nothing wrong with that. And maybe they kind of deceived, deceived themselves into, in some ways, of you know the the solveness of the game and stuff like that. But it doesn't matter 
Now, I wouldn't even go that far. Like, it just worked for them. It just Fine. worked for them. Now, yeah. I know that some of them later played Resistance, loved it, had great times. So, I don't know. Your, your rule as a critic um, is, is maybe to um, encourage the movement to, to better experience engines. But you're just yeah. dialoguing with it. But maybe it will, maybe there's a person who who cannot stand the resistance and loves Shadows Over Camelot. And while that's hard for me to understand, part of the critical dialogue is trying to understand that. I think. Yeah. Um. And then you know, just being fine with it. Like it is tempting to try to like dictate other people's tastes, <laughs> or it, it's difficult to yeah. avoid doing that because I'm. You know, I, I can occasionally be prideful, and it's easy to think, oh, really, they like that game? And I'm starting to realize that the solution isn't necessarily to think, oh, man, I could show them such a better game. It's just to try to understand what why yeah. they like it. Yeah. Like, it's not trying to move people towards better games, although that can be a byproduct of it. It's trying to create a deeper understanding... <laughs> It's trying to communicate a deeper understanding of your experience and in, in, in foster a deeper understanding of games and broader principles and values and virtues and all that. So, basically, I need to be more humble, as Kendrick Lamar might say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Kendrick Lamar is definitely the first thing I think of when I think of humble. <laughs> like, his biggest hit is called Humble. I don't listen to that. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, that's my thoughts. Talking about party games was actually talking about criticism. Yeah, we didn't really talk about party games all that much. Yeah, we did a bit. A little, yeah, bit. a little bit. We classified them. Yeah, like in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we got... But, uh, we started with prime numbers I, in Canada. <laughs> we ended with criticism. I, hope I, I think the podcast games. only got better from <laughs> there. I really hope you just cut all that out. In fact, we should record a new opening now. <laughs> I'll cut some of it. I don't, I don't know. Uh... The key to a good podcast is setting a low bar early, <laughs> <laughs> and then hope those people don't stop listening. That's pro tips from Mark. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hopefully you're still around. <laughs> don't forget to rate and review the Thoughtful Gamer on iTunes or wherever you, else you get podcasts if you're not using iTunes. Don't forget to check out the website at thethoughtfulgamer.com, which uh, has my review of Reigns, the Council, a very idiosyncratic party game that I gave a moderately high review to. We had fun. We laughed, uh, which is more than I can say for some party games that... Well, I reject a lot of party games that get sent my way, because like 80% of the review copies I get sent are party games, and they just look awful. And I'm like, no... Anyways, my imagination of what those games would be like, Reigns, is definitely better than that. You can find me on social media, Twitter and Facebook, and then soon, I haven't even told Matt or Ben this, I'm going to actually da, 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 da. I'm gonna actually try out Instagram. Whoa. What? <laughs> Apparently that's where all the people are. That's the thing. I didn't, don't know that's where the, the kids are. are using. I'm not on Instagram, but... Yeah, well, it's a thing. The pictures are square. Weird awesome. aspect ratio, but whatever. <laughs> uh, Weird yeah. aspect ratio. Yeah, yeah it's a one-to-one -one aspect ratio <laughs> yeah, on, I heard on Instagram better. instead of 16-9. Or 4-3 or, you know, whatever normal picture it's aspect like, ratios are. I think phones still do 4-3, right? For, for basic pictures? I don't know. I'm all about aspect my, ratios. My all-time greatest pun was when we were at... Um, this is going to barely make sense, and it won't even be funny. All right, great. I but love it. We were, we're rolling. Already. We were hiking Mount Mansfield in Vermont. Okay. And Mount Mansfield, from a profile, looks like a man lying down with his nose and chin. And then there's a, 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 a bump that looks... Like, um, well, we described it as an ascot, but he's also <laughs> lying down there. So I said that, oh, look, Mount Mansfield is there lying on, lying with his big ascot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the what joke. does this have to do with aspect ratios? <laughs> because I don't have the word <laughs> ass in them, Mark. <laughs> yeah, the way you said it, 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 it just sounded like... Wow. 
Anyways, uh, what else do I need to say? Oh, Patreon. If you want to support us and our ramblings, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. You'll also be able to watch our podcast live and get a glimpse of our cat and see all the areas where beer arrived and uh, we all opened beers. And that was kind of the point where the conversation got better. So take with that what you will. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Good night.